Good morning, First Church. Let's stand together and lift our voices in worship.
built up my own name, but the walls couldn't stand. I've trusted my own strength, but it was sinking sand. So I put my ruins into your hands and watched you restore them like only you can. If the Lord builds a house,
Yeah, that just about wraps it up, almost. We've had a stellar week at Vacation Bible School. As the kids gather, some of you guys can come up here. Come up, some of you taller ones can come up here, have a seat. So all last week, well, almost all of last week, we gathered here for our stellar Vacation Bible School. Every night when the kids got here, we met in the sanctuary for our opening. And then we came over here to Chitwood Hall, but it did not look like this. It was our galactic cafe where we had dinner every night. And we talked about the God sightings that we had seen from the day before. Our crews put their God sightings on one of these star-shaped plates and we displayed them over there. Before you guys leave, I would encourage you to see some of the God sightings that the kids pointed out this week at Vacation Bible School. There's things from egg salad as a God sighting, or my dad getting home safely, which is a God sighting. I know for me, a God sighting was each and every one of these happy, shiny, smiley faces, plus several more <laughs> throughout the week, and our volunteers. Guys, we had 150 children and nearly 100 adult and youth volunteers that came and helped us out for Vacation Bible School this week. Let's give all these kids and the volunteers a hand. Okay, all right, so these buckets are part of our Vacation Bible School too. See, we had a mission to fill 20 buckets for UMCOR, for the United Methodist Committee on Relief and their disaster bucket, uh, the, their disaster relief buckets. They were once called tornado bu buckets, hurricane buckets, flood buckets, but they're pretty much just any natural disaster. These buckets, kids brought in not only a lot of cash, but supplies that go into the buckets, things like um, trash bags and hammers and gloves and tape, and there, there was a list and they followed that, and we had enough supplies to fill nine buckets and raised enough money to fill the remaining 20 towards our goal and a couple more. Nathan Edwards of our care team, Nathan Edwards of our care, care team said, well, okay, great. We met our, we met our budget, our, uh, our goal. And every night when they were in music and missions, they added a bucket to their percussion section for a song we're about to sing for you guys. So they got all 20 buckets filled and Nathan said, wait, if we keep going, I'll do something. If we beat that goal of 20 buckets, he said, I'll dye my hair. He's, he has, if you guys haven't seen him before the cape, he's got luscious blonde locks. And then he said, for every bucket that we go over, I'll do a different shade. Or I might've said that, I might've suggested that. Okay, okay. <laughs> So I am happy to announce, drum roll please. We raised enough money and supplies to fill 22 buckets. Woo! So not only did these guys learn how to shine Jesus light in their own lives, they actually are shining a huge light across our nation with, the, with uh, raising enough money for all these disaster relief buckets. So the song that we sang along to, it's one I feel like you guys are gonna be familiar with. So it's This Little Lot of Mine. We got that queued up in the sound booth. All right guys, stand up. Congregation, stand up. Let's jam out to This Little Lot of Mine with the help of some buckets. Hit it. You guys stop your feet like that? Now let's clap together. That's it. Keep it going. Let's sing this little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, that sounds 
so good. That's called clapping on the back feet. All right, sing this real quiet. When I'm afraid, I'm going to let it shine. right where you are and if you have a bucket can you pass it toward the front for me thanks price good job Okay guys, so y'all have spent the week talking about all different kinds, all different times in life when you need to shine Jesus' light, right? So like when it's really hard to shine Jesus' light or when someone's mean to you, when people don't get along, that was one of the nights, right? So we're gonna shine Jesus' light all the time. And we've talked about and we've shown how we can shine Jesus' light by filling buckets for people that need help after a disaster comes, right? Well, we have something super special to do before y'all head upstairs. So I'm going to ask Mr. Daryl and Miss Lynette to come forward, if they would, please. So Mr. Daryl, you may have seen him around at times. Mr. Daryl and Miss Lynette. Uh, Miss Lynette's helped with VBS. So has Mr. Daryl in the past. You probably know them, right? So here's something really cool that they're about to go do. So Mr. Daryl has been praying into being in ministry, okay? Like doing something for Jesus, shining Jesus' light in his life, okay? So he applied for a job with a mission organization called Samaritan's Purse. And he and Miss Lynette are heading to Selma to go and to shine Jesus' light in Selma. Now where's Selma? What state is Selma in? Thank you, Alabama. So Selma is right here in Alabama. We send missionaries off all the time, and we've sent mission teams to India. We've sent a team to Honduras. Soon we'll be sending a team to Montana. We have missionaries that we support and we pray for all over the world. And how special is it that, one of, that two of our own are headed here within our own state to shine Jesus' light among us? So will you guys help me as we pray for them before we send them off? All right. Daryl, may you go forth and shine Jesus' light to those in need. Lynette, may you go forth and shine Jesus' light to those in need. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the many ways that we have opportunities to shine your light here and all over the world, from when we are so incredibly young all the way through our final breath as well. And so we give you thanks for this new season in Daryl and Lynette's lives. We give you thanks for your provisions, for the ways that you have cleared a path to help them enter into full-time ministry here and now. So God, we pray that you show them your path each and every step. Remind them that you are with them. Help them to shine Jesus' light and help them to experience the light with the people in Selma, your light that is always with us no matter where we are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, y'all are welcome to head with Miss Allie. Oh, sorry, maybe one second. Yes, no first kids in the sun since it is raining. That way.
As our kids continue to make their way out, there will be a QR code on the screen behind me, and I invite you to take out your phones, fill out that QR code. Let us know that you are here and you are worshiping with us this morning. Let us know if there's any way that we can pray with you or help you get more connected here at First Church. Obviously, as I was on vacation last week, I am behind on catching up with people, so if you have left something on that and you haven't heard from me, I promise, give me this week and I will reach back out to you. What a great day to be in worship together. Yes, it is rainy and it is gross inside, but how bright the light of Jesus is indeed shining here among us through our kids, through our leaders. So we give thanks for all those who have taken time throughout the week to help with our VBS in so many different ways, from food to being crew leaders to helping make science and art come alive for our kids. It has truly made a difference here at First Church, so thank you for taking the time to do so. So friends, let's take a deep breath. Let's remember why it is that we are gathered here in this space. Let's give thanks for the chance that we have to offer ourselves fully to God, our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, our witness, all that we are, all that we have makes a difference. It is because we give that the light of Jesus is indeed shining so brightly in the lives of so many kids this morning. And so we give thanks for the breath in our lungs, for the chance to gather here in this space and experience the light of Jesus. Let's continue to worship. There's a fable that you may be familiar with. It goes like this. A giant oak stood near a brook in which some slender reeds grew. When the wind blew, the great oak stood proudly, upright with its hundred arms lifted to the sky. But the reeds bowed low in the wind and sang a sad and mournful song. You have reason to complain, said the oak. The slightest breeze that ruffles the surface of the water makes you bow your heads, while I, the mighty oak, stand upright and firm before the howling tempest. Don't worry about us, replied the reeds. The winds do not harm us. We bow before them so we do not break. You and all your pride and strength have so far resisted their blows, but the end is coming. As the reeds spoke, a great hurricane rushed out of the north. The oak stood proudly and fought against the storm while the yielding reeds bowed low. The wind redoubled in fury and all at once the great tree fell, torn up by its roots and lay among the pitying reeds. This morning we are talking about what it means to stand strong. One of the characteristics of a child of God is that we are indeed able to stand strong. And if you are like me, then the image that you have of what it means to stand strong probably resembles something of an oak tree. Now, sure, a pine tree just bends and seems like it's going to topple and snap at any moment when the wind blows. But a giant oak tree, well-rooted in the ground, mighty, has stood the test of time for so many years it seems so strong, so fierce, so bold. It seems like nothing can ever come and topple that oak tree down. 
When we think of what it means for us to stand strong in life, perhaps that is the image that comes to mind for us, a human oak tree. Stand strong, stand proud, keep your shoulders up high and rolled back, keep your chest puffed out, take up as much space as possible, show the world how confident you are. Stand strong, plant your feet firmly in the ground and do not move. But when I recently heard of this of Aesop's fables, it gave me a bit of a different image of what it means to stand strong in life. What if standing strong actually is better depicted by a seemingly feeble reed? Not a big, strong, mighty oak. What if it means for us that to stand strong is really to be able to not stand proudly and mightily, but to be humble enough that we are willing and ready to bow down? in order to rise back up. This morning, we're talking about the prophet Jeremiah. This book of the Bible begins with a conversation between God and the prophet, a conversation where Jeremiah is very, very aware of his inadequacies, very aware of how ill-equipped he feels that he is for the task that God has called him to. See, the chapter begins, chapter 1, the very start of the book, begins with God and he talking about what Jeremiah sees. And Jeremiah says, God, I see this hot pot that is tilting from the north, boiling water coming to us from the north. God not only confirmed what Jeremiah saw coming their way, but also said just how horrible the destruction would soon be. Yes, yes, destruction was coming. They would soon be left in ruins. And to all of that, God says, you are chosen, though, Jeremiah. You are chosen to do something about this. Well, Jeremiah is quick to say, no, God, see, I am young, and I do not have a great ability to speak. He knew his limitations. He was aware of his inadequacies. He admitted to how he felt ill-equipped for what God was calling him to do in that moment. And to that, God said, I know you. See, I have known you since before you were born. You have been set apart. You have been chosen for this moment in your life. And God met him in his inadequacies empowering him to indeed use his voice to do exactly what God had called him to do. Destruction would come. It would be immense. The storm would be awful that Jeremiah would have to face. But through his trust in God, he would indeed find his way through the storm. Jeremiah 1, 17, and 9, 17 through 19 says, Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. There, in the face of the destruction that would soon come their way, the storm that Jeremiah would have to live through as a leader, as a prophet among his people, God made him a promise. Yes, The devastation is coming. Yes, the storm is coming your way, but you will overcome. You will be able to see it through because I will be with you, and I have equipped you for the task at hand. It's amazing that the very thing that Jeremiah pointed out as being his greatest inadequacy, his ability to speak, is the very thing that he would have to use in order to fulfill the calling that God had on his life. See, Jeremiah paints this picture at the start of this story for us 
that in order to stand strong through the storm that was headed his way, he knew from the very beginning that that would involve a whole lot of humility and a whole lot of being willing to admit his inadequacies and trust in God. He knew that there was no way that he could endure the storm that was headed their way. There was no way that he could be the prophet that God had called him to be for his people if he tried to do it himself. He would surely fail. He knew that he couldn't speak well. He knew that he was ill-equipped. He knew that he was young. But if he trusted in God, he could indeed overcome. And he would. The devastation did come. He would become the prophet whom scholars through time would nickname the weeping prophet for a reason as he reacted to and experienced all that the destruction had in their paths. But he would overcome. He would carry on and he would be the exact person that his people needed in that moment because he allowed himself to be empowered by his God. The way that Jeremiah was able to stand strong was not by being a big, tall, mighty oak. It was by humbly being a reed, aware of his inadequacies, aware of how ill-equipped he felt, aware of how he needed God's strength to see him through the storm of life. There was a ship that was out to sea. And a huge storm blew up, seemingly out of nowhere. This deckhand was down below, and he was very ill-experienced and ill-equipped for the job. It was his first trip out with that captain. Well, immediately as the waves began to get higher and higher, and the ship was getting tossed around more and more, the deckhand became even more anxious with each growing, crashing wave. Well, the deckhand, though, was young and confident, or proud, we might say, and also wanted to be in control of his future, and so he decided that he would storm up and take over the wheel, take over the helm of the ship. He would steer that ship through the storm that they were facing. So he goes up there, and he faces the captain, and he says, look, I've got this. I've got this fully under control. You see this storm? We're going to make it through. I'm going to take over, and here we go. Well, in his anxiety, as he got up there and he met the captain, he saw that the captain was completely calm, unshook by the waves that were crashing at the boat at that moment. While the deckhand was frazzled and frightened and and unsure of what would happen but wanted to be in control and take over control of the ship, the captain was calm and confident. Explaining to the deckhand, look, this is not my first storm at sea. I have weathered so many storms like this. Yes, it is going to be rough for a while, but we'll make it through if you let me take control of the ship. Well, the deckhand realized that he was not the person for the job at that moment. That if they had any chance of making their way through the storm, he would have to step back and let the captain steer the boat through the storm. When he did, his anxiety began to lower. He began to breathe a little more fully, knowing that someone who was indeed equipped and fully capable had taken control of that ship, and he didn't have to try to do it. So often in our lives, we feel that we are the ones who have to control everything, and we do such a great job of trying to do it. A storm comes in our lives, and we, like the deckhand, feel like we have to run up and take control of everything. We want to make sure that no one can see our inadequacies. We want to make sure that we don't fail and and bruise our ego. We want to make sure that no one sees how ill-equipped we are for what is happening. We want to cover up all of our failures, cover up all of the ways that, well, we aren't as strong because we have this idea that we probably have grown up with that strength, standing strong in a storm, looks like a big, solid human oak tree. And a human oak tree is strong and mighty and proud until it crashes down.
So often in our lives, we are those trees. Whereas the prophet Jeremiah paints this different picture of what it looks like to endure the storms of life. He knew from the very beginning that the only way he would endure that storm, the only way he would overcome what was ahead, the only way that he could live into the calling that God had for his life was if he humbled himself and fully trusted in God to see him through. The only way that he could do what it was that he was created to do was if he allowed God to be the captain through the storm that was ahead for them. And he did. My question for us this morning is just that. Who's the captain of our lives? Where do we place the trust in our lives? When the storms of life come our way, are we, like the deckhand, quick to try to take over, quick to try to proudfully say, here I am, I can do this, I can take control, knowing in the inside how ill-equipped we are for the task? Or are we humbly like a reed, bowing down, enduring the storms, trusting in God that one day we will indeed stand back up? Anxiety begins to escalate the more and more we try to control our lives through the seasons of struggle. The more proudful, the more prideful, the more that we feel like we need to be a mighty oak in the midst of the storms of life, the more our anxiety skyrockets. <clears throat> because there, through that, we try to stress ourselves out covering up every inadequacy. There's no room for weakness when we are called to be proud. There's no room for inadequacies when we are a tall, strong, mighty oak tree. <clears throat> Sorry. So, why then do we need to be humble when we find ourselves in seasons of struggle, when we find ourselves in places where the storm is raging all around us? Why would we choose to be a reed when we could choose to be a tall, mighty oak tree? Why would we choose to take the role of being a deckhand when we feel like we can totally take control as the captain? And how do we even know where we are on that? How do we know if that's where the role that we are in at this moment? I think there's two ways that we check that. The first is that we take an inventory of ourselves. We ask ourselves honestly some questions. Maybe they're things like, how stressed out am I? How much do I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders? How much time do I spend, energy do I spend throughout my life trying to cover up all of my inadequacies, all of my failures, all of the ways that I'm insecure so that no one around me sees that? How often do I think that pride takes over and humility is long gone in the process? The second inventory to take is the inventory of our relationship with our God, our Creator. And ask ourselves honestly, do I only turn to a split-second moment of prayer when I'm in the middle of a storm and I'm not sure what to do and then I carry on with my life? Or do I have a deep-rooted connection with my Creator, the one who knows me so well that he knows my inadequacies, he knows my failures, he knows my flaws, and he says, here I am. If you will trust in me, I will indeed equip you to get through this storm. Just as he met Jeremiah with an answer for his inadequacy of his, his ability to speak, so he meets us in the storms of our lives saying, I see you, I already know this about you and I'm here for you. I will guide you safely through the storm. I will indeed help you to overcome, help you to endure.
but you have to put your trust in me first. So friends, where does our trust lie? Do we trust ourselves as incapable as we may be to overcome the storm on our own more than we do our creator? When push comes to shove, do we try to take over because we feel like we can do it better? What's our image of standing strong through the storms of life? Are we willing to be humble like a reed, seemingly fragile? Or do we feel the pressure of trying to be a solid, mighty oak tree, carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders? If we are indeed to find ourselves in a place where we can say as a child of God, one of the characteristics of being a child of God is that I am able to stand strong. Then friends, I pray that we take a bit of advice from Jeremiah. And we do so humbly. And we do so with a spirit of accepting our inadequacies, our flaws, our limitations admitting them and saying, God, if you want to use me, so be it. I don't think I'm the right person for this, but if you have a plan for that, then that's great. But here's where I'm at. So that God can say, I know. I've known you since before you were born. You are set apart for this moment. Trust me. The storm will still come but we will find our way through together. So friends, whatever storms of life we may find ourselves in, whatever destruction, whatever ruins, whatever chaos, whatever ways that God is calling us to step out and be an example of his light in the world, may we embrace those opportunities, those bits of our calling from God, inadequacies, failures, flaws, limitations, and all, and say, God, here I am. I trust you with my life. I know that you can do something amazing, even though I know how much I have to trust in you in order for that to happen. And together, with God, may we make a difference in the world. As our kids have learned this week, may we shine the light of Jesus everywhere we go. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you thanks for the chance that we have to shine your light every day of our lives. We give you thanks that that may indeed call us out of our comfort zones. That that may indeed require us to use things that seem to be our limitations, our inadequacies that it involves us trusting in you because we know that we cannot possibly do what you have called us to do without putting you first in our lives. So as we gather here in this space, maybe we're aware of the ways that we try to take control of every bit of our lives. Maybe we're aware of the ways that our pride gets in the way. Maybe we're aware of the ways that we try to be a tall, mighty oak tree standing firm on our own instead of bowing low to you so that you can see us through the storms. So God, refocus our lives, refocus our hearts. Help us to rely fully on you in this moment of our lives and in every moment and every storm to come. For we know the storms will indeed still come, but we can overcome, we can endure through your grace, through your power, through your strength. So equip us for the journey and send us on our way as we trust and we know that, that you do indeed promise to be with us in every single moment and every breath we take. So whether that calls us to Selma, Alabama, or whether that calls us to Honduras or whether that calls us right here in Tuscaloosa, God, use us. Use us to shine your light here and now. It's in your name we pray.
Church, will you stand with us?
where does our trust lie? When it all comes down to it at the end of the day, do we trust more in ourselves and our own ability to overcome on our own or do we indeed place our trust in the hands of our creator? The one who knows every single thing about us and still calls us into this great life where we have a chance to shine his light everywhere we go. May we rely fully on God. May we place our trust in God first and foremost and allow God to use us to shine his light all over the world. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.